Good evening. Um, can everyone hear me? Possibly see me? Great. Thank you for the waves and the thumbs up. Welcome to tonight's event. My name is Selena Choate. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am the vice president for the board of the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. And it gives me great privilege and honor to welcome you all to tonight's uh, talk back um, event um, featuring uh, Gretchen Cern and uh, Rick Burns, um, who collaborated um, an effort to bring us Driving While Black. Um, and this is really important as we continue to address racial issues in America. Um, and for those who are new to the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, our work is geared towards bringing awareness and unveiling um, African-American history, Black culture in the state of New Hampshire, as well as in the nation. And so it's one, what, what we do is connecting our past with our present, and which will hopefully help us to build a more inclusive community for our future and future generation. Um, the issue of driving while Black in America has been something that African Americans have grappled with for many years, decades even. And it's really an honor for all of us to be able to hear from um, the author of Driving While Black, um, Gretchen Surin, and to learn more about this um, issue of racism, and mobility in space and how it's difficult for um, a lot of African-Americans to um, even enjoy certain freedoms like driving, you know, um, and being able to get around from, you know, anywhere. And as we can see, this is an ongoing issue in America. Um, and, and I hope that you all are in a position to really learn and engage in a conversation um, about what it is, what it means um, to be uh, in a position to drive while black in this country. Um, if you enjoy events or programs that we put on, I uh, like this one tonight. I would encourage all of you to make a donation or a contribution of any size to the trail so that we continue we can, can continue to put on these programs and events throughout the year. Um, please. Uh, sign up for our electronic newsletter. Um, Jerry Ann um, and, and um, our, our support staff and volunteers have done a, some great work with promoting events and, um, you know, uh, happenings that are, are, you know, keep us all abreast on what's going on. And so if you want to get like the latest information, please sign up for our e e electronic newsletter. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for tonight's um, discussion. Dr. Lowell C. Matthews, who goes by Chris, joined Southern New Hampshire University in 2012 and serves as Associate Professor of Business Administration and Management, Lead of Project AIM, and Director of the University Honors Program. He serves in leadership roles for several nonprofit organizations, including the Endowment for Health, World Affairs Council of New Hampshire, Downtown Manchester YMCA Advisory, Advisory Board, New England Names Project, Granite State Gays Men's Association, Hookset Area Rotary Club, and Queen City Pride. Um, before he comes on, I just wanna say these are all local organizations. And if you're not familiar with them, please take the opportunity to get to know um, a little bit more about some of these organizations and chapters um, that are helping again to create a more inclusive and equitable community here in the state of New Hampshire. So without any further ado, I would like to turn it over to Chris uh, to moderate tonight's event. Thank you. Thank you, Selena, and welcome again, everyone. I was so honored to be asked to moderate this session between Gretchen and Rick. I was like, if there's anything I would like to do at this particular time, it would actually be to be here with all of you at this moment. So thank you 
to everyone for joining us and being part of this very thought-provoking uh, conversation. As many of you know, Gretchen Soren is the Distinguished Professor and Director of Carper Stone Graduate Program of State University of New York. She is the author, of course, of Driving While Black, African-American Travel, um, and The Road to Civil Rights. Rick Burns is an American documentary filmmaker and writer. He has written, directed, and produced historical documentaries since the 1990s, beginning with his collaboration on the celebrated PBS series, The Civil War, which he produced with his older brother, Ken Burns, and wrote with Jeffrey Ward. So I would like to officially welcome both Gretchen and Rick. Thank you both for, for being here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So this well, is a- Thank you for having us. I, like I said, I, I'm really so, so excited to have this opportunity. I feel like I'm in the presence of, of greatness after being having the, uh, the opportunity to, to watch the documentary and to view it, many ways it resonated with me kind of at this personal level, you know, being, being a, a black male and, you know, living in um, the United States, I was able to directly connect with many of the stories that, that were shared. And I think my first kind of question did to get our conversation started would be, um, how did this project come to be, Gretchen? Like, what, what was the catalyst for it all? Well, actually, the catalyst was a, a colleague of mine who teaches at Bard College, um, Myra Young. She handed me, we were working on an exhibition together in Saratoga Springs, and she handed me the cover of a, a little guidebook called the Negro Motorist Green Book, and she asked me if I had ever heard of it. And I had never heard of it, and I was curious about it. So... I decided I wanted to do some more research to find out about it. And that's really how we got started um, on the, that's how I got started on the research. And I had not yet done my dissertation. I was uh, kind of late getting my PhD um, and I wanted to use this topic as my dissertation. So it started really um, as a research project. And it, you know, the whole process of driving while black, it's a very, uh, it's about movement. You know, it's about mobility. It's about um, the 20th century and the most important um, invention of the 20th century, the automobile. And I really felt strongly that it needed to be a documentary film. Um, and I had this old friend who I thought was a fantastic filmmaker. Um, I'd seen a lot of his films and I approached him um, we were on a panel together for the Organization of American Historians, and we, I, I asked him if we, if we could go out to lunch. I wanted to talk to him about a project idea I had, um, <clears throat> and I, we went to a little restaurant in Manhattan, and I popped open my laptop, and I said, I want to show you some pictures that I think are very compelling, and he looked at the pictures, but I think most importantly, the, the waiters and the waitresses were, were behind us looking at the pictures and just transfixed by these pictures. And Rick, right then and there said, this is, let's do this project, it's wow. important. Wow, that's great. So Rick, what made for you the story so compelling? Well, um, I think it was, first of all, I, I do wanna say, you know, Gretchen had, I interviewed Gretchen, who's sort of, breadth of whose knowledge about American history is so wide. And she'd been in a series that my colleagues and I had done about the history of New York. Um, and she'd been very eloquent and extremely powerful in that. And that's where our kind of friendship began. Um, and so I was kind of inclined, you know, if Gretchen wants to do something, you know, I'm, I'm on board. But I think that this particular story has this um, remarkable quality which not all stories do, which is that it's a, on the one hand, very specific, the green book, the Negro motorist green dot. Um, but of course that reality, that, that specific story, you know, Victor Green and his wife Alma start the magazine in 1936 because they know that, that while the automobile has been a liberating instrument um, for African Americans in many ways, it's opened up a whole whole new horizons of danger and threat. Where are you gonna, where, you know, if you're gonna go to the bathroom, what does that happen? Where are you gonna sleep tonight? Where are you gonna eat tonight? Where are you gonna get gas? What if you needed a doctor, God forbid? Um, and 
at the same time, it sprawls across the entirety of the American experience. Um, and I mean that in space. You know, last time I looked, the uh, interstate highway system had, you know, 41,000 miles on it. And that's just the interstates. You know, there are a lot of roads here, they go everywhere. Um, and so this question of auto mobility and the African American experience across the last four decades of Jim Crow up until the 1960s is really central to that. But of course, it goes back further in time. Right. Cole, we, Gretchen and I talked for a long time about what subtitles of this film should be. And when we hit upon race, space, and mobility in America, driving while black, race, space, mobility in America gives you, I think, a sense of like this very specific point of departure, but this sort of amazing sort of comprehensive um, quality to the story because it's kind of everywhere and goes back to before 1619 and comes right down to today, even if automobility is right in the middle. And so looking at those photographs and that lunch uh, with, with Gretchen, she had a, you know, her laptop open. And I mean, there were thousands, Chris, of photographs. Um, all of the same thing, all the, it's the America we know, very intimate, right. you know, Howard Johnson's, a gas station here, a mobile station, you know, the Rotary Club. Oh, but right next to the Rotary Club, it says KKK, Ku Klux Klan. Mm. You know, and you realize that there's this kind of parallel, what one of our remarkable, remarkable historians, Eli Lola, said, you know, there's America's about a parallel, parallel highways. And to be able to be as a, as a, as a, as, as a non African American, as a white American, to be able to sort of have one's sense of the, intimate, familiar, breezy reality of the American car and automobile and highway culture, to have it be so directly connected to this extraordinary experience of race and mobility um, and space was just, was phenomenal. So I mean, hats off to Gretchen for um, yes. that instinct she had when, when Myra showed her the cover of a green book, because I think that she really, um, she knew she was onto something. And I, it's been an amazing process for me to be involved with her in this. Perfect. One of the things that I noticed right from the beginning, Gretchen, is that you take us back, right? Uh, when I first just was reading the title before reviewing um, the movie, I yeah. kind of had this, my mind made up that the starting point was going to be today, right? Mm -hmm. But when I started watching it, I was like, oh, we're we going back there. And yes. then we're going to go back a little further. So what was it about starting at that point, going back and really telling the story through that particular lens? We, we know um, when I started the research, the, sto the story went back gradually. Um, you know, first thinking about the automobile in this, I started with the present, but then as I looked at the origins of the automobile and then the origins of the trolley and the buses and the, and the trains, you know, so we're starting to go back into the 19th century and thinking about, well, where does all of this, where does segregation start? What is segregation about? How do we understand the 20th century? You've got to go back, you know, you've got to go back to the 19th century. You've got to go back to the Civil War. You've got, and then really the story evolved as one that you really, you really have to go back to slavery. You really have to understand the formation of police departments. You have to understand um, runaway slaves and, and, and the, the idea, the need to control African-American bodies that begins as soon as an African-American steps foot in the new world. So I think one of the things that the documentary does that I hope the book does as well is to help people to understand um, how history informs the present, how we understand how we got here um, because history helps us to, to uh, understand who we are today and how we got here. Right, that, that is so evident. And you think about it, Rick, I wanna ask you, when you're thinking about it, when trying to relay this message to particular a white audience, how were you able to kind of do that? You know, this is driving while black, but we yeah. want it to be accessible to a white audience that has a completely different experience. Right. I mean, um, I, I don't quite know how to put it without this sounding wrong. In a sense, the film is for white Americans. Um, 
you know, not one person we interviewed who was African American for this film hadn't had the experience either as a parent or a child of the talk. They're now old enough, to drive, they're gonna be going out there. And we, you know, what happens if you get stopped by the police? You know, um, I, I got my driver's license when I was 16, you know, the day I turned 16 in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I got no talk other than don't drink and drive and obey the law. And so, you know, I, I think that the, the, the virtue and the advantage and the, and the great power of this area of American history is that because it's situated in, you know, within the common denominator of the automobile on the highway, every, who doesn't get in a car, who doesn't drive, who doesn't, you know, who hasn't gone on a family vacation. And, and yet it also allows you to see, you know, this phrase, which is along with wokeness come under attack and you know, systemic racism. Well, if you want to know what systemic racism is, check out race, space, and mobility in America, you know, from 1619. And it's very clear, you know, that there is a tremendous um, profit incentive to immobilizing populations who are going to work. That's just been the case. And every time in the history of America, in the history of America, that the benefits to um, white people of that um, inequitous distribution of mobility as per race as under threat, we've had a huge, huge explosion, of which, of course, the Civil War was the first. Um, and then again in the 20th century on a couple of occasions. And, you know, surprise, surprise, driving while black. It's, it's happening now. Right, right. Um, so I feel like as, a, as an instrument, as a way to get people to go like, wait a second, don't tell me this is about the past. That's why we call the driving while black. And that phrase itself is to connects us to issues having to do with mobility, race, space. They go all the way back. So, you know, I, I hope it's something which in a non-remonstrative way speaks to all audiences, including white audiences, and says, hey, this is just the way it is. This is how it came down. Um, and I hope that that is something which broadens minds. Right, right. And uh, you really get that from the, the documentary, this sense that we're currently living in this situation today. And today was caused by all these previous decisions that were made in the past. Yeah. And over time, what happens, people begin to view kind of where we are. We, we've made progress. But one thing that I feel the film does a very good job at indicating or kind of showing and showcasing is that progress is not always equal. Right. Um, and that progress has been limited by some. So Gretchen, can you speak about kind of that dichotomy a little bit? Um, well, let me first add that one of the things I think, I think this movie resonates because everybody has the experience of driving and or being in a car. And that is one of the reasons that um, I think we've had incredibly strong, positive reactions from people who are not African-American um, because they can relate to this experience as well. And also, I think everybody relates to the experience of being stopped by a police officer. Perhaps that experience has been very different than it is if you're African-American, but people can relate to that experience. So there is um, kind of a, a shared understanding. I um, mean, that really gave us the way in to the story for people, you know, that's the kind of doorway through which everybody can relate to the to the topic. Um, and so, and, and now I lost your question. I've totally no, 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 no. You're 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 right on track. So, as you're thinking about these experiences, and we all can relate to kind of that common denominator where we know what the car feels like. It gets us from destination A to destination B, but we all have access to these automobiles, to these wonderful tools, instruments, but we're not able to kind of use them equally, right? We're not able to move through the space at the same. Uh, and so how, how do you deal with that? We all have access, but we're not able to use the automobile equally. Well, and the, you know, the, the interesting thing is that the automobile is so much more important to African Americans, I think, than to white Americans because it freed African Americans oh. from 
the Jim Crow bus or the Jim Crow um, train car. So the, the automobile becomes a, a vehicle for freedom. Forward, if the automobile can make it, we can definitely make it too. Uh, so one of the things that I noticed was the use of, and kind of highlighted it at the beginning, the use of photos that were inserted throughout the film, throughout the documentary. And I know it's often said, you, you know, that cliche, you know, a photo is worth a thousand words. But for me, the photos kind of brought about this intrinsic feeling. I could actually, in many ways, felt that I was there in that moment by seeing that photo, by viewing the photo. I got a strong sense that I was able to kind of really feel and better understand the individual stories that were being told and shared. And so when you're thinking about those individual stories, why do you feel it was so important for you to include the kind of those firsthand accounts instead of just kind of a, a summary of it? Do you want to you want to answer that, Rick? Yeah, uh, and you too, Gretchen. I mean, yeah, I will. you know, I feel like in a way, this is kind of like America's home movie. You know, 300 million people on the road in their automobiles, you know, taking pictures taking videos, now using their eyes. And there's stuff from all those media. It's really what's, what I think is really what's powerful about the story. So it's not just that they happen to be there. Um, the movie wouldn't exist without that kind of testimony. So it was, you know, really, really crucial. It was like in many ways, that's everyone's family. That's everyone's auntie, uncle. That's right, that's um, right. And you, right, you right, know, the experience right. is really, really different. You know, there's something which we didn't include in the film, which is William Blackstone, the um, English juris, uh, um, legal thinker from the 18th century, who had a profound effect on the form, you know, the foundation of our country through his commentaries on the law, defined freedom as locomotion, mm. self-originating locomotion. So it's not a kind of like, sure, it's an abstract principle. It's also a, a, a kind of almost scientifically visible reality. If you can move yourself when and as you wish, you are free. Mm. We'll put it that way. And then you realize like race, space, and mobility in America has been um, contending with this issue for a very, very long time. And, you know, we're getting a little bit of that kind of feedback right into this conversation, some of which is just childish, but some of it is coming from the same thing. Right, right. As you pointed out first, Chris. So, you know, the relevance, the, the white, hot, burning relevance of this. Yeah. It can't be ignored. It really got me thinking how the mobility of people of color begins to make the dominant majority very uncomfortable, right? as we're moving into these spaces, uh, physically being present, just the act of being there makes those make, make certain individuals very uncomfortable. Gretchen, do you want to kind of add on to that or well, speak to that? I have to say, we're a very segregated nation. And people live, people don't live side by side. They don't know one another. And people are afraid. I mean, they have seen the stereotypes in the you know, the, the stereotypes in the media, they've, we've grown up with them. And, you know, the stereotype of the large male black man who is a criminal is in, you know, people's minds, uh, erroneous as it is. And I think that because we don't encounter one another uh, by living side by side, going to school together, working together, um, it, there are often times when people are afraid. So you have what happened to Ahmed Aubrey, right? He's just jogging in a, a neighborhood that's perceived of as a white space because spaces in this in, in our culture are black spaces or white spaces. And we perceive of certain spaces as, as white spaces, places where black people shouldn't shouldn't be. Um, and he was just jogging, right? And but the perception was well, he must be up to no good. He must be a criminal. He must be a thief. Um, and, and we make these uh, judgments about individuals for the, for no reason other than we're we're afraid. Yeah, I think, and that often that fear results in the death of somebody. 
you know, somebody, uh, uh, James Baldwin says, uh, and somebody has to die. And I often imagine like um, the film also does a good job of really highlighting like this, the emotional toil and anxiety that mm -hmm. driving while Black actually causes an individual to go through. Uh, and many times um, we're so used to it, we're so accustomed to it, we kind of, it kind of becomes the norm. And then we find ways to kind of make sure that we're prepared. So always having you know, an extra emergency kit in the back, having your, you know, your, your, your pillows and everything you need. And I often remember many times when I had to drive from the University of Delaware, where I went for undergrad, back home to Tennessee, which was a 13 hour drive. My parents were very clear about what time I should leave, where right. I needed to stop, who, who, yes. who I was going to call. It was, it was a whole list. If something came up, I needed to go to this particular person's house for help. Uh, and this was before we had these wonderful, you know, iPhones and everything. Right. We still found a way to kind of navigate that space. And it took so much time and energy and it was so exhausting just for me to make that trip home, just to spend time with family. When my other, you know, <laughs> college roommates and everything were going home and it was just a normal trip, just a normal journey. But for people of color, Driving While Black was just a definitely different experience. Um, and so how do we move forward from that? What, what's next? Well, I would like to see some uh, police reform. I, I really believe strongly that we need to reform police departments, that we need to have civilians involved in working with the police. Um, and I think that's, that's got to happen. I think more people need to see Driving While Black the the documentary film um and i'd like to see more community conversations like this one about that about the topic amen i mean and also i think you know it's tough ahmed arbery george floyd the list goes on and on and on um you know i think at these moments where that we're, we're in one of them now have been you know for the last five years politically and culturally where the issues of you know, um, like, you know, white guys marching, you know, in Virginia, Jews shall not replace us. Or, I mean, all the, the strong sense that the perquisites of whiteness are under assault. Well, when, when we have these moments, it's almost always a sign that change is happening. That's where the motivation for the rage and the the horrendous behavior mm -hmm. and that's, you know, I, I think that there's hope, Chris, I think in the fact that we're clearly the big gears or at least the medium sized gears of history on this question are moving right now. And it has to do with demographics, it has to do with the changing complexion of our society. Um, and it's incredibly positive change. And unfortunately there's some people who don't are not eager to embrace that, but they'll learn. And, and here's the thing, it doesn't happen of itself, but there is no going back. Mm. Right, right. Yeah, there's no reversing. No, that's right. There's no reverse. There's no reverse on this, on this particular car. Uh, right, right. So, which is, I think, also what makes some people very frightened um, as well. Yeah. Because the handwriting's on the wall. I mean, America is going to be a, the largest Spanish-speaking country in the world by 2040. Um, mm -hmm. the, um, you know, globalization means the intermixing and mingling of people culturally, demographically, you know, sexually, you know, in every conceivable way. Um, and that the threat to, um, to white, um, invidious white claims on mobility and space which is really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. You get more motion through more places, just nobody has to, you don't have to pay anybody for that. Just right, right, um, right. So. I love that. So I would like to invite any of the um, audience members, feel, feel, please feel free to use the ch uh, chat with any questions. This is a, a talk back. So we want to definitely give you the opportunity to share your thoughts about the film as well as 
ask questions, any questions you have. And we will have moderators that are um, asking, what will be that will be moderating the chat for us. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And thanks, everyone, for your patience for hanging in there with us. We appreciate that, despite the interferences that we had. Um, when viewing the film, it was very clear that as the automobile came into invention and there's the, um, the interstate and the systems that we're putting to place to really provide access to the American dream, the ability to kind of move and go on these family vacations. Uh, there was this hope of optimism and you see it in some of the footage that you use, particularly with the older commercials. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was looking at these commercials, I was just like, what, what, what's going on? Like, like, can't you just see this? Like, what, tell, talk to me about that a little bit. Like the yeah. use of these, these commercials into the documentary. You know, <laughs> in the USA and your Chevrolet. Yes. <laughs> you know, it, it is, it is shocking the degree of racism in American advertising up until a certain point. And then suddenly American advertisers went, you know what, there's a market outside the white, but television in the early days of television, it was almost as new, each new media did have to go back into the past. And, and the, the degree, the lack of integration in American television for the first 15 or 20 years, was just shocking. Um, so that, you know, everybody, you know, Everybody looked like Doris Day, you know, everybody had curly blonde hair, you know, it, it was just as white as white can be. And it's really, it, it, it's funny because it's really almost like shooting, you know, fish in a barrel, um, you know, the testimony, the evidence for the truth of this story is like on the surface of our culture, in the signs, in the advertisements, in the you know, in the behaviors of people to be sure, but also just, you know, it was, nobody was hiding this because you didn't want to hide it. That's why you put the Ku Klux Klan sign right next to the Rotary Club sign on the way into town, you know, or sun, the phenomenon of sundown. I mean, come on. Like, yeah. you know, uh, Thurgood Marshall, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, one of the greatest legal thinkers um, in the history of America. His experience standing on a platform in Baton Rouge, going to Shreveport, it's mind boggling, you know, because he's in a sundown town. And people like him, as he was pointed out by a thoughtful racist white man, you know, don't get out of town alive if they're not gone by 4.30 in the afternoon. I mean, that was in 1938, my dad was 13. You know, I, I, it's just, this isn't yesterday. Well, and that it's interesting that I was talking, I, I did another talk where I, I talked about the fact that sundown towns were all over the United States. And um, I, I, I mentioned a few of them, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, Darien, Connecticut. And um, now this was, this was last week. And my daughter said to me, Arian Darien? Um, it's known even today as Arian Darien, Connecticut. Now, if that doesn't tell you something about the lack of, you know, the, the, about continued segregation in this country, it may not be segregation by law, but there is still segregation by custom. Mm. And, you know, the, this problem that we all live with, that we don't know one another well, you know, I, I ask my students, how many of you have had a, a close friend who is African American or a close friend who is um, uh, Arab American or Asian American? You know, we don't know each other. And so we rely on these, these stereotypes. But there, there was not an African American in an, an automobile advertisement until the 1970s. Wow, that I did not know. So all of those, those uh, see the USA and your Chevrolet that Rick is talking about, those are all white folks. Right. Wow. I want to change the 
discussion just a little bit, just to have you share your opinions and your thoughts about kind of the, the negative side of the automobile, particularly how it impacted the kind of small businesses, the mom and pop kind of convenience store in that local community. And now all of a sudden we have access to this car and we're able to travel to, you know, a mall or travel to a, a larger grocery store. What, what are your thoughts about that particular kind of aspect? You know, I'm really struck by what it's almost, in a sense, is almost the opposite phenomenon to what you're pointing out, which indeed must have existed, the kind of, you know, the way in which the local became, you know, overlooked as, you know, people could move brands locally, um, more or less at will. But what's really striking to me, and it's a centerpiece of Gretchen's work, is the way in which that new translocalization created Black businesses across this country. Mm. Amazing network. It wasn't as if it didn't exist before, but it just kind of like, boy, did it grow and build because you knew you were going to have like people coming from across the country in their car. And so whether it's the Marsalis Family Motel in New Orleans or, you know, times a million. Um, across you know, hairdressers, beauty salons, restaurants, motels, car repairs. And that, for that incredible period from the 1920s and 30s, especially down through the 1960s, you had this flourishing um, African-American business culture um, because of the new automobility. Um, and so in a certain way, if you go like the Ma and Pa store, you know, lost out as America, you know, you know, wheeled itself around further and further places. But at least during that period, it was a tremendous, you know, a tremendously seminal force in, in Black business culture, which we live with today, with the irony being that, you know, with the civil rights movement, another huge complicated part of the story is that once African-Americans could, by law, go where white Americans had previously been keeping them out, they did. But Black Americans did not, I mean, white Americans did not then go to the Black enterprises. And margins of profit being what they are, I mean, Gretchen, you can give the statistics of, you know, how many of those places, these Black businesses, which flourished, you know, in the heyday of Jim Crow, you know, by 1980, 1990, well, what, how, how far down it had fallen? Gretchen? I'm, I'm sorry, my, my, um, Internet is unstable. I just got a message and you were both all frozen for the last minute. So I, <laughs> no, just the impact on the black business culture of America by the, of the civil rights movement, which couldn't have existed without the automobile. But then once those laws were in place, you know, it was very tough on the black businesses to make an ends meet. And I was just thinking about how, you know, your, your knowledge of how, what a tremendous impact. <laughs> had. Yeah, I, you know, I think, you know, that's one of the ironies of this story because African-Americans worked so hard to break open places like Hilton Hotel, Howard Johnson's, you know, to get access to mainstream accommodations in this country. So when mainstream ac accommodations are now available to them, they go there, you know, they stay at Hilton, they stay at Howard Johnson's. And what that means is that it, it cuts enough of the business away from black businesses that many of them go out of business. And the reason is not so much that all African-Americans abandon black businesses because they don't. What happens is white Americans do not go to those businesses. They don't use those businesses. What I have seen recently is a push all across the United States um, to let people know what businesses are black businesses. Um, people are sending out lists. Um, Amazon posts, you know, their black suppliers. Uh, QVC posts their black businesses. Um, the bookstores are telling us these are black independent bookstores, so please frequent them. And people are, you know, I think that's a really good sign that people are starting to use black businesses intentionally. There was one question that came up in the chat that uh, kind of takes us back a little bit 
of what we, we were talking about, the police reform. And Ellen had asked the question, um, can you provide any particular types of examples of how that reform would look, look or how it would actually take place? Um, I think that, for, for me at least, I think that police should have some uh, civilian oversight. I think oversight panels, over, an ombudsman that does oversight, um, you know, something that gets ordinary people involved with police in conversations about what's appropriate behavior. I also think that, um, we, we look at policing very much as a, a adversarial in this country. You know, the police, it's the police, and then there's the lawbreakers, and everyone is a lawbreaker. And we don't seem to see, you know, that the vast majority of people are honest, hardworking people. Maybe they occasionally, you know, uh, uh, speed or do, you know, break the law in some minor way, jaywalking but they're, they're generally honest, law-abiding people. And for the police, we have to change the mindset where police think of everybody as this incredible lawbreaker, you know, a violator of, of, of the law. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with getting to know the police, you know, getting them back into the communities. They're not, they don't walk the beat anymore, right? So they don't know every, you know, they don't know everybody on their block. Um, and we've got to find ways, I think, of getting conversations with police so that they know the people that they're there to serve. Um, I, I also, I like the idea, and I know this won't happen, but I like the idea um, that they use in Canada that when you're a police officer on duty, you carry your gun with you. When you're off duty, your gun stays in your locker. I don't think that's going to happen in the United States, but I do like that. I do like that idea. Um, I also like the idea of policemen as problem solvers. You know, finding, finding the problems that are out there in your community, what can you do to help? Is, is, it, a, is it easier? Can you solve a problem by getting a, a, a drug counselor? Can you solve a problem by a, with a social worker? Can you solve a problem with, you know, um, an after school program? Are there other things that can, you know, take kids off the streets? Or you know, how do we deal with people who are mentally ill? You know, can we address the mentally ill with uh, people who know how to handle mentally ill people rather than with policemen with guns who don't know how to address the people who are mentally ill? Can we bring those people into the police department and make them part of the team? You know, I live, I live in a small town on the East Coast called New York City. And <laughs> amazing thing has happened. Um, which, you know, with the election, the likely election of Eric Adams um, as the next mayor of New York, the second African-American mayor. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Adams, now borough president Adams and soon to be mayor Adams, you know, is a policeman and a police reformer. And now he's mayor of New York. And, and you know, We'll see how things work out, but when I think that that message that's going to be, and it's not only going to be for New York, because you know the New York mayor gets a last time I checked gets a lot of airplay, and what you're going to see is someone who is very clearly not anti-police. He was a policeman for most of his career before he went into politics, but he's tremendously geared towards police reform. And so I think it's almost, you couldn't have invented a better personality, um, better personage to come in and in the biggest city in the country um, with all the media that's here, lead an effort which has to do with both, you know, big problem, rising problem of gun violence in New York. Um, nothing like it was 30 years ago, um, but still a, big, a bad uptick. At the same time, a need for police reform and at the same time, People, you know, people don't want to really define the police. They want the kind of police that Gretchen was talking about. They want partners and people who are, you know, their fellow citizens with and who can they can work together with. 
Um, and so it may be just kind of a funny happenstance of this moment in New York City's political history that, you know, try having a reform-minded black policeman become your mayor. That could really help. Um, you know, he's really, and he's, and he's also got this kind of, got the kind of sharp edge New York personality that people want in a New York mayor. It, it doesn't come in any one style. Mike Bloomberg had it, you know, Ed Koch had it. You know, but you can see Eric Adams is one of those dudes who, like, he's just, he talks the talk. Um, so I feel, I feel like it may be an interesting few years in some, some way of, you know, finding a way forward um, on, on exactly these issues having to do with the police and mobility. Right. And take a look at Newark, New Jersey. Newark, and I'm, I was born in Newark, so I'm excited about this. Newark, New Jersey... Um, last year changed their policies on policing. And last year, after they changed their policies, not a single police officer shot his gun in the entire year, not once. So it can be done. They were very proud of themselves. Yeah, they right. um, you know, instituted the policies that every policeman, they, they had training and they followed their policies. And they, it meant that nobody was shot they didn't even, nobody even unholstered their gun. So, you know, we're talking about a major city that's considered, was considered a crime ridden city at, at times. I think it shows us that it can be done. Yeah, there's, it's definitely possible mm -hmm. if we want it and we can figure out a solution. Um, the documentary has been out now. What has been for you kind of the, the ultimate experience like? Or I mean, how are you feeling now that you have the opportunity to kind of get some feedback from viewers? You've been able to kind of be part of several kind of community conversations, PBS, CNN, all over. What has this experience been like for, for the both of you? I feel incredibly um, honored that Rick took on this project because I think he was the right person to do it. I, I, I can't say enough about the, the collaboration, the, you know, some, I, he was just the right, he was the right guy. <laughs> this has been an incredibly um, gratifying experience for me um, personally. Um, people have been incredibly, they've they've loved the film they have um you know the thing that people say to me most is i didn't know if they were if they're white they say i didn't know thank you for thank you for helping me to know and if they're african american they've said thank you for recognizing my experience so it has been just an amazing um opportunity i think for for and for me to get to know even better than I knew before Rick Burns and his wonderful wife, who I is a dear, dear person and friend of mine. But it's it's just been, it's been great. It's been a great experience. I feel, I, everything, you know, I just want to say what she said. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that and it's really, you know, one of the really great things about this, the kind of work that I do making documentary films is I like being in college for your whole life. Um, and to be friend, friends with um, and then collaborators with Gretchen on this project has just been, it's been really transformational. Um, it's been really, really interesting. They're hard to do. I mean, I got to say each opportunity feels like just an uh, invitation to complete humiliation because it doesn't get any easier as you get older. It just gets, you know, you maybe hopefully your, you know, your forehand gets better, but it's still, you know, <laughs> It's hard. Um, and it's a hard so, topic. Yeah. It was a hard topic because it was so broad. But then at the same time, you know, Gretchen was our main on camera person. She was the creator. <laughs> she wrote the book. She knew where literally all the bodies were buried and where all the archives were and where the photographs were. She knew. So it was kind of like, you know, we couldn't possibly have paid her enough because she had like 14 different roles. Um, you know, so it, it was really in that respect, it was really, and, and also Gretchen, the joy you bring, um, I don't think I know anybody more courageous or joyful 
um, than Gretchen Soren. And <laughs> that but was I, like, know, well, there you go. <laughs> I think for us, the project just matters. It really matters. You know, it, it, it makes us feel at a time when the country, a lot of people in our country were hopeless. You know, it, it made us feel that there was hope um, and listening to people's response, you know, we, we felt hopeful that, that it could, the film could really make a, make a difference in people's lives and in the way our country um, thinks about policing and about African-American history and culture. And it spans, you know, it really <clears throat> was something we hadn't thought about before, but it really, it goes from the beginning to the present. And it talks about every aspect of, you know, African-American life and culture. So it's a really broad sweep. Thank you both for just doing an, an amazing job. Like it, I can't say my gratitude enough. Uh, at this time, I would like to open it up to our guests for the questions, if you have any that haven't been answered yet. This is your opportunity to ask those questions. It would questions. be great if we could ask Ellen Fine what warning out is, because I don't know what that is. Okay, Ellen, would you like to respond to that? Sure, um, and thank you both um, for all of your work and actually all three of you to, for your dignity and grace through our interruptions as well. Um, warning out was this system that was used against impoverished folks. Um, and it was also used much at the end of enslavement in New England. So if somebody left that household where they had been enslaved, which finding so much enslavement in New England, um, they couldn't really go into another community because um, then the community said, oh, well, we'll have to pay for you. I and mean, this is a different time period. But as I was thinking about it, and as you were talking about sundown towns, and so the people would actually have to stay in the household where they had been enslaved, or they would end up in some of the, um, what were known as the praying Indian communities. Really? Um, and, and these sort of marginalized squatting mm -hmm. areas like Concord, Massachusetts, um, South Natick, Stockbridge, places like that. So I'm just kind of thinking that this, the phenomenon kind of goes really far back mm -hmm. with this lack mm -hmm. of mobility. And so it's just in every era we see it. And I think it's so interesting to go way back to unwind it so that we can like really see where it precedes yep. the era of the car. That's so fascinating. Thinking it's about really that. fascinating. You know, you see that this, you know, the image of slavery um, conjures up the image of a shackled human being i.e. that person has been immobilized and all those extraordinarily disturbing, um, you know, sort of neck braces that were meant to decrease the mobility of, of, of men, almost invariably men, um, African-American men who, you know, if they did want to run away, they'd have to run away with that thing around their neck. You know, or the fact that, well, you know, all those Africans who came over initially they got a transatlantic boat ride, but that was forced mobility. So you're so right, Ellen, that it's just, it's not just, I, I said this so many times, this is not just an American story, which it is. It is the American story. 100%. You know, I mean, and this is what's the thing about New England um, and New York as well, that is so troubling that we've been finding out is how many of the ministers mm -hmm. were enslaving other people from 1641 to 1783 in Massachusetts? We just celebrated Elizabeth Freeman Day, um, um, and but oh, yeah. in New Hampshire, slavery is is legal, I believe, until um, 1857. It's still on the books. Is it that late in New Hampshire? I, you know, I mean, I think there's three people listed as enslaved and most of, you know, the, the trade uh, leaves Portsmouth in 1806 or seven. But yeah, I mean, I think I would love to see even more deep work than, you know, I, I want to see more films about the New England beginning of the trade. Um, hey, I think live free or die hot. Huh? Yeah. The North has gotten away with um, this in, in, in textbooks with this 
kind of the, the North is good and the South is bad kind of attitude. Um, and yet what we're seeing, um, we, and we see it in New York with, with the Dutch. I mean, the, the Dutch uh, held slaves and, you know, and, and so did the, Eng obviously the English did as well, but it's not, the slavery in the North, much of it does not end until almost the Civil War. Right. But there, this, the North is complicit, right? The, the textile mills are making the clothing for the slaves. And, you know, the banks in New York are providing um, funding. It's, you know, all of the institutions in the North are supporting slavery at the same time that many people in the North are saying, but slavery is really a bad thing. Right. You know, but they're they're supporting it. it it's uh, the the enslaved people are are the commodity that are worth the most in the new world in the colonial period. They're worth more than anything else. And so, of course, um, you're right, Rick. It is the American story because that's that is what built the country. I mean, you know, Both of human beings. The the figure of what percentage of the national economy, the cotton economy was, like 50 percent. Wow, I didn't know it was that much. I mean, yeah, I when you take up all the different ways in which it's woven in, so it's not just, you know, separating short staple cotton from its seed with Eli Whitney's cotton gin. Right. It's, you know, it is massive. It is across the country. It connects us to Europe. It has to do with fabric and manufacture. And when half of the United States economy is involved one way or another in trade that enslaved people are doing, you know, that they didn't call it cotton was king in Mississippi for nothing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, it was the oil industry of its day. Right. Yes. Um, and it works so well when you have this immobilized population. Uh, doing this crucial, crucial beginning work, you know, and, you know, the hypocrisy of the North is really, you know, uh, Robert Penn Warren, the novelist, and he said, like, it was the, he called it, you know, you know the South, had, South got branded with the lost cause, but the new North had the treasury of, of virtue. And you just want to say, come on, as, as, as Gretchen is inviting us to do. I mean, you know, I, I'm sitting here at 110th Street and Riverside Drive, and there's a beautiful, amazing um, sort of recreational facility built on top of a sewage system called Riverbank Park. It's incredible. It's right opposite Harlem, so it's kind of like in the 130s, sticking out into the Hudson River. You see it every time you come up and down the West Side Highway. The number of white people you see at this place is scandalously small very close. It's the best facility, sports facility of its kind on the west side of Manhattan from the Battery up to the Spite and Dock. So here we are in New York City, the most famously liberated, enlightened town. Sorry, Boston. Second most famously <laughs> liberated. And what you have is you have hate segregation by race. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying anybody's forcing that to happen, but that's the way the choices get made. So it's stuff that, you know, this is our world. Uh, and the kind of, kind of getting to know each other business um, that Gretchen, you were talking about, mm -hmm. seems really, really crucial. Really crucial. Additional questions discussion points. Did everybody do their homework? Okay, Claire, I see, I see your hand. What's your question? Um, it's not a question so much as a story I would like to share, especially with people in New Hampshire. Um, in the late 1960s, I was married to uh, an African American man who grew up in Manchester, New Hampshire. He was one of two black students at the largest high school in Manchester. There were very, very few African-Americans in New Hampshire at that time. Um, once a year, there would be a picnic. Maybe they still do it. And there were about 
25 families in the entire state. And we would get together with them that one time to have a, a, a get together. So that tells you um, how small the number of minorities was at that time. We lived in Agunquit, Maine, which is three towns over from the New Hampshire border. And periodically we would drive to Manchester to visit his parents. And at that time, Route 101 was not a highway. So we were going on and off Route 101, um, but it was basically a country road. And we, we had a used Chevy Impala, you know, see the USA in your Chevrolet. <laughs> His father was a mechanic at the uh, at the air base um, and had a, a gas station and, and so forth. And so we would dri be driving on these country roads. And, you know, this is the 1960s. This is not now. Very different. And there was a particular state trooper who would uh, look out for us and would always pull us over and always give us a hard time and just did not like the fact that there was this Chevy Impala with a large black man and a young white woman in this car in his territory. And one time in particular when, you know, he was just fed up with us coming through his town, uh, he forced my husband out of the car at gunpoint and forced, he insisted that I stay in the car and he forced my husband at gunpoint to walk down this road and go down a dirt road. And I had no idea whether I would ever see my husband alive again. Now, this was a long time ago. I was very young when we married. And um, that experience for me as a white person a young white person woke me up to the realities. I mean, many things about having a black family and being the only white person in my family woke me up, but that woke me up in ways that um, no other white friends or, or anybody could understand. But like you say, that is a reality that every person of color in this country knows in their DNA. And, um, and so it, it woke me up in ways that strike me as how masses of people woke up when they witnessed the, the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm not wild about technology and modern stuff. I'm pretty old, but, um, but I have to say that um, you know, cell phones have made, have torn away the mask of all of this yeah. and forced white people to witness what I witnessed and experienced half a century ago. Um, and I think that until you actually experience it yourself or feel your loved one in that level of danger, like the man that you interviewed in the film, a very, very touching interview with him crying, talking yes. about how would you feel if it was your son in this danger? Um, my son is in his 30s and, you know, I, I work, you know, we live in white Maine. I mean, you know, I, if he has a headlight out, I say, you get that fixed. You don't give an excuse to one of these, you know, cracker cops to get, pull you over and give you a hard time. You don't, you know, and that's not something that white parents of white children have to deal with yeah. at all yeah, on any level. But I, my, my hope is that the younger generation who is growing up seeing these visual, um, you know, images of black people doing nothing wrong, getting dragged out of their cars, getting killed in their cars, etc. And you know, this is nothing new. 
It's just that a camera was on it. Yes, that's absolutely. It. That's it. It's this huge point. Clara is, is amazingly powerful story. Experience. So, you know, decades later, after my husband died too young, um, I was driving on 101, Route 101, when it became an actual highway. It wasn't a country road anymore. And I'm driving down it and I'm talking to him in my mind and I'm driving past this part where there's a state trooper's car and I look and I see and there's a black man in a New Hampshire state trooper outfit. And I just said, Gary, I wish you could see this. <laughs> Thank you. For it is sure. a happy. Let me tell that story. I just That's felt like great. this audience would would understand that because you're in New New Hampshire. Oh, thank you. That was great. That 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 personal experience does seem that 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 really is at the essence for me. Uh, the what the whole documentary is all about is really bringing those stories to to life because it happens to to all of us, right? We can experience that. We could do a second. Second volume with more stories. Oh my God, yeah. absolutely. Three or four. And I was thinking as Claire was talking um, so so eloquently, Chris, that um, in a way that's what one hopes to do in a film is to create an experience that's really, really, you know, it's not just out there. It's not just happening up on the screen. It's actually getting into people's hearts. And so it, it becomes an experience they've had. And that that's what any filmmaker is trying to do, you know, it's like the film's only so long, a couple hours long, um, but during that experience, somehow, hopefully you've gotten really intimately close to, to people in your audience by telling them this kind of story, in which case then they can vicariously and, and emotionally, they can feel it. Mm, right. Christopher West's incredible thing there. At the end of our film, he was the gentleman who talked yeah. about. <laughs> Other questions from anyone in our audience? This has really been a very um, deep discussion. So thank you everyone for joining us, for being part of the conversation, for hanging in there with us despite the interruptions that we had. Um, and I just want to, again, kind of personally state my, my, my honor of being in the, the presence of both Rick and Gretchen. I've truly admire your work and what you've been able to accomplish. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for Chris, that. thank you for thank taking you. such good care of us. It's really been wonderful to be part of this conversation with your with your amazing people here. We greatly appreciate it. And I'm going to, at this time, hand it over to Kim. Hi, everybody. I'm Kim Crisp. I'm a board member at The Trail. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for this very important discussion of this wonderful film. I watched it for the first time last night. I wasn't able to make it to Prescott Park on Friday to see it. And by the way, thank you to Prescott Park um, Arts Festival for showing the film and hosting it Friday evening. I did watch it last night on the PBS streaming portal. If you go to amazon.com, you can get a free week of um, PBS. Um, so that's where I watched it. And why I'm sharing that is in case you have friends, if you want to see it again, you can watch it there. Or if you want to share it with friends, that's a great place to, to steer people to watch this very important film. Um, thank you also for everybody for enduring all of those unfortunate interruptions. Um, I'd also like to thank, of course, our distinguished panel, uh, filmmaker Rick Burns and Professor, Professor Gretchen Soren for um, joining us and being a part of this. And just your insight, your, your knowledge, your, your wonderful film. I have a degree in history and my focus was the civil rights movement of the 20th century and uh, i watched the film last night and i was so impressed by the breadth of history that was covered in two mm -hmm. hours in the film okay. and covered in a way that did not seem like you were skipping through things either oh it's frozen the screen keeps freezing it'll, it'll unfreeze in a second i ran out as they were starting to and then open the doors for you because I thought, oh my God. Um, 
Mm -hmm. at Southern New Hampshire University in Manchester on October 22nd and 23rd. It's gonna be a virtual hybrid conference, conference. And the focus of the panels will be crossing J River Jordan, healing racial wounds through accountability and truth telling. Um, you can find more information about the conference at the Black Heritage Trail website, blackheritagetrailnh.org. Um, there'll be more information coming soon on how to sign up and register for the conference. Anyhow, I would like to thank everybody again and hope everybody has a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.